Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We are in Exodus 33. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. Here's the text. Now Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp at a distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent, and they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance to the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. As all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up, then bow and worship each one at the door of his tent. The Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. His assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. That final verse seems mundane as a logistical detail, but to me it indicates something significant. Joshua had just watched Moses talk to God, and God talked to Moses the way that a man talks to his friend. He had just beheld revelational epistemology upon its delivery. He had just borne witness to a breach of the metaphysical realm into the physical, whereupon the creator, the arbiter, the logos, the author, the judge, the creator intervened and spoke the way that a man speaks to his friend. The most accessible means of communication ever, carrying the most sacred knowledge yet conveyed in the history of mankind. Moses seems like oddly used to this by now. <laughs> we remember Moses in Midian. He had killed a man in Egypt and fled. And then he sees this burning bush and he's overcome. We see Moses on Mount Sinai. He beholds the glory of the Lord and his face is rendered radiant for a time as a result of it. And we see Moses meet with God a lot, but this is all new to Joshua. Joshua was Moses' protege, the one whom Moses was discipling and the successor to Moses' leadership. The book of Joshua would begin with this promise from God to be with Joshua as he was with Moses. Now, be very strong and courageous. The be strong and courageous call would come from God multiple times to Joshua upon Joshua's succeeding to Moses' titular position of leadership over Israel. And it even come from the people of Israel. And they would commit that they would follow Joshua the way that they had followed Moses. And this new generation of Israel, Israelites, possibly everyone who was uh, under the age of 20 when the census was taken. See our curriculum a couple of weekends ago. I think that was session eight. They all committed to follow jo uh, Joshua the way that they'd followed Moses. But it took strength and it took courage because we can see right here that Joshua was overwhelmed, perhaps, that Moses would go to the tent of meeting, talk to God, and then say, in the Jesse Campbell translation, got it, and then go. But Joshua, Joshua, just having beheld uh, the delivery of revelation, is like, I need a minute. <laughs> I just, just give me a second. I got to take in what just happened here. This is the weight of revelational epistemology. This tent of meeting is fascinating. This is where God talked to man. It's no small thing. It's how we know that our epistemology, our study of belief, it's how we know that we can know things with certainty. It's not certainty based on our own intellect. It's not based on an eidetic memory. It's not even based on a comparable or scientifically authoritative data set. It's because it came from God. We don't know everything, but God does. So when God talks, we are 100% certain that he's right, that he's good, that he's holy, he's just. We are 100% certain that when God says what's going to happen, it's not a prediction, it's a prophecy. And it's as good as done. 
from God's perspective, observing the whole of time. Because he's God, when he talks, those are the only words that we know are 100% accurate in the universe. He is the alpha, he is the omega. He created time, hence he is outside of it, in the same way that a painter is independent from his own painting. The painter's existence is not dependent upon the painting, but the painting needs the painter in order to exist. Think of not only the universe this way physically, but also the fourth dimension of time itself, that time exists because of God. And so God, the timeless, uncreated creator who holds all of time itself, when he gives prophecy, for example, it is as good as done. We just live here and are en route to there. If you're listening to this only on audio, I referred to something I've done in the past describing God's perspective of time as an arc around him. Think the musical notation of a fermata with God as the fixed point whose existence is not graphable uh, linearly. It can be if you think of it that way with no beginning and no end, but it's more accurately presented as a fixed point with no beginning and no end. And time, linear, right before God, is his creation over whom he is the sovereign author. So God may prophesy that he will do something, and in fact, many times throughout the biblical narrative, he does this. He says what he's going to do. And then from God's perspective, it's already done. That's why the book of Revelation exists. That's why he's already described the end of the world while we're still living, because he exists outside of time. This revelational epistemology moment that took place in this tent for crying out loud was the most epic thing Joshua would ever see in his life. More significant, I believe, than the parting of the Red Sea. Now, notice as well, though, that this is not the tabernacle. This is, this is the tent of meeting, all right? The text says that he pitched a tent outside the camp. Hang on a second, Jesse. Why have we been studying this huge structure that was prescribed by God and gave the blueprints for this outer courtyard and the most holy place and the goat skin coverings made of 11 panels, one for each of the 11 sin offerings prescribed in Leviticus 4? And what is it about the cherubim laced uh, fine linen on the interior and, and the, 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 braze, the, the bronze basin and the, the, the gold lamp stand, think like the original menorah, uh, the incense altar that's 18 by 18 by 36, and the Ark of the Covenant that's 45 by 27, and the mercy seat that is also 45 by 27, containing the stone tablets and the budded staff of Aaron one day, and the, the jar of manna. Uh, what was the point of all that if Moses just goes outside the tent? It goes outside the camp and pitches a tent. You can see this. It's at a distance from the camp. The tabernacle is supposed to be right at the center of things. At this point, at this point, uh, God is dealing with Israel. And Israel is a little wild, prone to idolatry. And we have not yet arrived at the full tabernacle. But this is not too bad a substitute. We see that Moses goes out there. And when he goes out there, it says when Mo whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up. And they would just watch Moses until he entered. And then the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance to the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And as, the as all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up and then bow in worship, each at the door of his tent. Because Despite their proclivity unto rebellion, this first generation of Israelites knew what was happening. They knew Moses is our representative. He's going to go talk to God. God is talking right now. Everybody shut up and kneel down. They understood the weight of what we refer to in a rather academic term, revelational epistemology meaning we believe what we believe because God has revealed it to us, hence the term revelational. It doesn't seem so clinical in the way that it was experienced by the Israelites. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem quite so academic. It, it really, truly is uh, cataclysmic, and it's epic, and it's historic, and it has direct bearing on us today. This is trans significant because it was God talking 
And today, that same law makes us conscious of sin. That's what Paul writes about the law. God was talking to Moses. And so this is, this is saving knowledge, but it could also be damning because God's setting laws and we fall short of them. They had a proper reverential awe and respect for the way God conveyed his word to us. And in no short order, in a rather meta self-narrating fashion, the text of Exodus 33, 7 through 11 accounts for its own origins. And you and I are reading Exodus 33, 7 through 11 right now. This is a meta nonfiction book, and it describes details as to its own authorship. The whole book is Holy Spirit inspired. It's all been given through Moses along with Genesis and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, all of this was inspired by God through Moses, except for perhaps the very end of Deuteronomy that could have been inspired through Joshua because it describes the death of Moses. But this is no small matter. We are reading the Bible as the Bible describes how it came about. God wrote the book we're reading and studying every single day. Take a moment and pray a prayer of deep set thanksgiving and awe because the one who knows everything talked to us.